show the tail adoration and just explain what goes on. Um, the only prayers you'll need, I hope it's in every book, are from this book handout, but then the inside back cover of this thing should have a sticky. Not in every book. Not in every book. But we have, we have this. Mm -hmm. Would you know, the book I pick up has an in There's many that are Okay. Well, Catholics here, you know, none of these do. Catholics, you know Salutaris and you know Tantumera, right? So you, you'll lead the way. Well, it's all Catholics here. I mean, we're not our, our uh, elect. Oh, Salutaris is on here. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, I wanted to point out that we do have resources like that. Let me get it. This one's got one. That one's got one. Okay, I've got one in mind. Remember earlier we started the charcoal, right? We can smell that so we can get the incense going. Um, this, for those, but <laughs> I'm telling this to you, but you all know this, I mean. <laughs> It's, and Bob is recording, right? So that's right. That's good. Bob is recording. This is called the monstrance. So as you'll see, the consecrated host is a little door here. The luna is what goes. The luna is what goes in here. It's called a luna because it's kind of in the shape of a crescent moon, you know. So it's called it's called the luna, uh, but. This, this is actually a new one. We want to pass it around. It's so beautiful. Somebody very graciously gifted this to us. Very expensive. Well over $10,000. Big for a king. And that, you know, this adder is very blingy, right? Uh, and, and it's supposed to be blingy. That's the whole idea. This was the Jesuit response back in the days when the Jesuits were Jesuits. Mm -hmm. This was the Jesuit response to the Protestant Reformation. You know, Protestants were questioning, not Luther, but, but Zwingli and those guys started to question real presence and, and they, you know, came all sorts of crazy stuff. And there were a lot of various people that responded to that through catechesis, explaining, you know, I mean, basically explaining if you go back as far as you can go to the earliest, earliest fathers of the church, they all held the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And so they were trying to academically or catechetically or apologetically argue for it. The Jesuits took a different approach. They said, you don't believe it? Watch what we're going to do. And they came up with these super blingy monstrances. They had processions through the streets with them. They, they, they basically said, we believe it. We don't, you know, if you don't think it's true, you don't think it's true, you watch us. So that, that's kind of the origin. That, you know, the kind of very blingy monstrances go back to like the 17th century. Okay? Before then, it was touch and go. Uh, before then, it was a lot like the way the Orthodox are today. The Orthodox believe in, they have, they have valid sacraments, they believe in the real presence as we do, but if you're familiar with the Orthodox, they do not have any sort of adoration or processions or whatnot. They, they reserve the Blessed Sacrament, the consecrated bread anyway, in the tabernacle for communion for the sick and for Viagra. That's what they keep it for, not for adoration purposes and so forth. So we kind of differ in that way, and it, it, it kind of came about with people questioning us, and we made it clear that we do adore Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. It's, you know, Luther, well, I don't know, Luther believed in the real presence, um, but the Lutherans kind of drifted. I wish, I wish Anthony was here, because Anthony is a Lutheran. And there are the two kinds of, there's the Evangelical Lutherans, and there's the Missouri Synod, and what's the other one? I forget which is which. But they don't believe in transubstantiation as we do. They believe in consubstantiation. So during the liturgy, they believe Christ is somehow present with the bread and with the wine. But then once the liturgy is over, they believe it just re reverts back to ordinary bread and wine. And so if you go to a Lutheran church, they have the Eucharist. They seem to be very reverent and holy with it. But then when the, they're, they're uh, Lord's Supper, as they would call it, is over, 
They take what's left over, put it back in the Ziploc bag, and put it with the rest of the host to be used next time in the sacristy. You know, so they do not believe that, you know, we believe the bread and wine no longer are bread and wine. Their substance, what they are, changes into the body and blood of Christ, and it remains, it, 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 it persists, continuing to be the body and blood of Christ after consecration. It doesn't turn back to bread anymore. Uh, so, you know, there were all these, again, when you say Protestant, you're saying a meaningless thing, right? Protestant means which one of the thousands of Protestant denominations are you talking about that believe various things? So when we use this, that's how uh, we will do that. I will find, let me also find the bells for somebody. When, always during the liturgy, always during the Mass, um, and, and even here for benediction, adoration, and so forth, this monstrance sits on a corporal. Okay? <laughs> Basically, the corporal is a crumb catcher. Okay, so during the Mass, it's, you should really do everything on the corporal so that if there are any crumbs, you know, and, and th uh, this, this one has been, I, I took this from a place where I knew it was freshly laundered, okay? Uh, and so what I'm about to do makes me cringe when I see people do it, but I see people do that, you know? Uh, you never know, how do you know if it's been laundered or not? You know, you're done. Uh, so I, you never, sh this is called showing the flag. <laughs> you never show the flag. You know, when you, you always watch what I do, when I get up to the altar, I take this thing and I unfold it like that. So if there are any crumbs there, okay, and then when I'm done, I fold it back up again so that any crumbs are contained inside. Yeah? Sir, what if, you, what if there are crumbs and what do you do? Well, we have a special sink in the sacristy here and in the church where it has two side-by-side -side sinks. One of them is a regular old sink that goes into the septic system. The other one goes straight into the ground of the church, which is consecrated ground. So this, this would get rains in that special sink. So if there are any crumbs, they would go down there. Uh, usually they rinse it and then bring it in and you launder it the good old-fashioned way. Yeah, that's called a French duration. What's that? It's called a French drain when it goes right into the ground. It's called a French drain? Yeah, yeah. I never do that. Okay. Why, is that how they did it in France or something? I don't know. It's just, well, I was in the construction business. And... French drain. All right. I remember that. I learned something. Let me find, let me find the bells so that somebody could ring the bells. Because normally during adoration, during the benediction, there are bells. And who wants to ring the bells? Who? You looking for a volunteer to ring the bells? Do you want to ring them? Okay. Do I need to up? No, no, you can do them from here. Um, I should light some candles. I always do have candles. I should have lit them before, but I forgot. Can I do those other things? Yes. There's conflicting things, you know. There's <laughs> some times you go to adoration and they'll have candelabras with, you know, well, these are three. We have some seven candles apiece, one on each side. So <laughs> it kind of looks very Greek Orthodoxy, lots of candles because the Blessed Sacrament is exposed on the altar. I remember one memo, email flew by my desk saying, you shouldn't do anything different for the adoration than you do for the Mass to show the connection between adoration of the Blessed Sacrament outside of Mass and the connection with the Mass. So, I don't know, this is what we do here. We don't really have candelabras that, that, that we can use. Um, the vestments are the usual vestments. I was going to take Naomi today and get her fitted with one of these because basically this is the owl, right? 
you see we always wear alps. The alp is basically your baptismal garment. Okay, so technically anybody could wear an alp to church. It might start to look a little strange, it might look like a gathering of the clan or something if we all started to show up in, you know, dressed like this, especially in this like, kind of the hood. I think that would be fun if we did that one day, everybody come to Alice. To tell the story with Carol once, I have another one, I don't know if it's here, or it's probably it's somewhere, it has to be dry clean. And, and Carol brought it to the dry cleaner, and the woman at the dry cleaner was a black woman, had a big hood to it. And the woman at the dry cleaner was a was a black woman. And she takes it and she's holding it. And she goes to Carol, what, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and you had to do a real quick explanation there. Of, uh, uh, but you could imagine this, you know, this, this one. And of course, the stole it. So I took the Our Lady of La Leche stole. I always kiss it, we tend to kiss it to show respect for the office, right? So here's, here's the stole. These, a lot of radio of La stole were a gift from our head sacrist and Nancy Jordan to everybody, so that, that's where this came from. Uh, the other vestment that goes with this is the coat. This is called the coat. I will wear it today. I usually, I usually don't wear it because, well, you know, I don't wear it in the summer, it just starts to get too hot, you know. But it, to me, it's too blinky. I don't want the attention to be on me, you know. So you'll notice, unless it's really cold in here, I won't wear it, okay. I'll wear it today simply because it's part of the normal vestments for, for adoration, but I wish I had a nice, a nice simple one. And it's called a coat. It's basically just what people used to wear as an outer vest. And then we get this hood out of the way. How does he get dressed without you? What's that? How does he get dressed without you? Do you need some help? Do you need help? No, I'm, I'm <laughs> totally used to doing this myself. It's like a man. I was just going to say, it looks like a man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anything. <laughs> Deacon, no, are you saying coat with a T or coat? C O P E. P. You were having a hard time coping with it. Yes. Maybe we can buy some material and then see if Diane can help us. But not this lame stuff. I don't know. I can try. Well, a nice, simple, you know, I thought I would wear a simple, lightweight one. Okay, I have an idea. I know a great shop for vestment material. It's like in the heart of Rome. Just a little field trip. Something a little field trip, yeah. It's good in Rome. Yeah, I made a um, chasuble for for a Okay. I know you know. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of you remember Rita Stefanovic. She was here. She she sewed a lot too. She made a special one for Deacon Angel because Deacon Angel was short, and if he put this on, it'd be dragging on the ground. So uh, it was a, a much much shorter one that that she made for him, and also very lightweight, but also very lame kind of material. Very glitzy material. I don't, I don't tend to like the glitzy material. Um, but, but anyway, this is, this is called a cope, C-O-P-E. Now, what the, what, during adoration, we found out the hard way. I'm supposed to be kneeling, but my knees are shot, so my kneeling days are over. I don't have cartilage in this left knee because of this leg length discrepancy, so, oh, long time ago, I think the year before I was ordained, which was like 20 years ago, I had the cartilage was detached, so they not only torn but detached, so they had to take it out and throw it on bone, and it's just a disaster. So that's why you see me going down steps like an old man. Well, I am an old man, but I go down the steps in a way that I don't have to bend this knee. You know, I kind of go down sideways and kind of hobble down the steps. Now you will be watching to watch me do that. I'm getting even more self-conscious about it. But and, and that's the problem with it. I have. I think back in here, I should remember to get it today. I have a knee pad that I use like for Good Friday when you're supposed to prostrate, but I may even just skip that this year. Because when I, when I do kneel, the last 75% of me going down is free fall, you know? So I want something on this knee so that when it goes bang, you know, it doesn't hurt that much. And, and you can go to Home Depot and get knee pads, and that's what I did, and I put it on one. You can't see it, but we're now. 
Uh, there are resources in the pew for um, adoration. There's, now, some of the books have it. Andy found one that did. Some of them on the inside back cover has a piece of paper, an insert here, that says Eucharistic Exposition and Benediction. And it has it all in one place. I don't know why some books do and some books don't, but that's the way that is. In the pew, you will find other resources here. So if you're here and you want to pray, for example, uh, there's a couple of laminated sheets. Right? Uh, prayers for our Holy Father's intent. Prayer to our Blessed Mother. Prayer for preparation. So there's various prayers here to help you pray. Uh, on the other side, there are prayers that are for our normal adoration days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, but you know, you can pray them any time, obviously. And then there's a white laminated sheet in the pews that looks like this. I think most have it. No? Yeah, some, some do. And you see what's on there are prayers to be used during exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. And then the other side, short scripture passages uh, for use during exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. So scripture on one side, prayers on the other. Uh, if you need aids to help you pray, they're here. If you go rummaging on, it's a back literature rack there. On the back table, people often leave things. So there's plenty of things that uh, you could use. Uh, you know, I, I might also suggest, though, being like St. Joseph and just sitting in silence and listening. Right? St. Joseph's big strength was not in talking, but in listening. That's a big part of prayer. Listening, listen, listen, listen. So Joseph said his yes in silence. Uh, he did as the angel had commanded. Uh, that's a good model for us, too. Um, okay, so if you could pass, I don't know if every few has those, but you could pass those around. Uh, the other thing that we will use during exposition is this thing. It's called a humeral veil. Now, Naomi isn't here, but who's a medical person? Humeral veil. Humus is like that part of the arm, right shoulder, something like that. That's the humus. And what it's for, you know, you, you put it on. I'll put it on for now. I'll take it off for a bit. I'll put it on and leave it on. You put it on. How many layers do we have? <laughs> that's why I don't, you see, but that's a good why I don't always wear the coat because it's better these days because the um, lights now are LEDs and they aren't thrown out to kind of heat where they used to. But you know, you can imagine with all the layers, it gets a little hot. Um, the humeral veil is used for the benediction because you'll see I'll pick up this monstrance like this and, and then give, give the blessing with it. Now, I don't know, I think people assume that you do that because with the sacred host in it, you can't touch it or something. That's not, that's not what it's about. When a bishop, a priest, or a deacon gives a blessing, he does so with his hands. Right? When I bless you with the monstrance, the blessing is not coming from me, the blessing is coming from our Lord himself. So we cover our hands. That's all this thing, fancy thing is, is a way to cover your hands. You know? so. Nothing more than that. Now, it does dress things up a bit during, like, for example, on Good Friday. The Blessed Sacrament will not be in the church on Good Friday for our 3 o'clock service. It'll be in here. So, mm -hmm. probably I'll be the one to come here and get it. And I'll wear this thing and carry the Blessed Sacrament kind of like this inside this thing. There's really no reason to do that other than to add a degree of solemnity to, to, me, to me doing it. Okay? This is the whole purpose of this is to cover your hands when you're giving a blessing with the monsters. So, and uh, there we'll, we'll begin in a minute. We'll, have, we'll go for questions. I have the incense ready to go. I came in and started the charcoals. Uh, made a mess in the process, so just so you know.
<laughs> Melody promised she would come and clean up because we tend to run a little late. Um, we the, the we'll start with traditionally, you know, the, the Latin has remained. We start with the, the, the hymn of Salutaris, which is uh, some of the books on that inside book cover. Then there are various prayers you can add. You can have silence. You know, silence is, again, we tend to underestimate the importance of silence. A lot of people get nervous when, you know, when they, if you're silent for a minute or two, everything is fine. Once it gets beyond that, you can start to hear people fidgeting and, and you know, what's going on? I used to all this silence, you know. Uh, but silence is something good to, to get used to. Uh, and, and so, Will Christie brought a, a, a prayer. She has the litany from last week that we will pray from last week's handout. In the back of your handout from last week is the litany. Um, the precious blood And of course, the sky's the, there's books galore that you could buy about prayers before the Blessed Sacrament. There's, there's, there's just dozens and dozens and dozens of them. In a lot of places, they're free. Keep your eye on our back table here or in that back literature rack. People will have extras and they'll leave them. So, so you don't have to buy them. You could probably find them. Go to a lot of other churches, they have tables with all sorts. In our hall, we have all sorts of prayer books. I would not be at all surprised if that book table in the hall with the sign that says free books, help yourself, if you'll find a couple later that might be prayers for adoration or just prayer books in general. Um, incense, you know, incense is a symbol, the smoke rises, it's a symbol of, of our prayers rising, rising to God. Um, Typically, this is this goes back. Now, this is not just a Catholic thing, right? The Jews would have the altar of incense in the temple, and that would constantly be be going. That was uh, Zachariah's job, right? He was in the holy of holies, doing the the, the Jewish the, the, the Levitical priest back then, of which Zechariah was one. Uh, would kind of have they were like the reserves, you know? They would have ships that the, you know, had they were on duty for some period of time, and then the next one would come. He was on duty as his previous, he was tending to the altar of incense. So uh, when the angel Gabriel visited him, was it Gabriel that visited him, and said, you know, the, the, the whole episode in Luke's Gospel of, of the birth of John the Baptist and so forth. Uh, so that you know, incense goes way, 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 way back to the Jewish temple. Even the first temple always had the altar of incense. So, a lot of what we do, as you well know, it, at least for the first part of the liturgy of the word, is basically what Jews did way back then. What Jews do today, if you go to a, 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 a synagogue service, right, you, you would see very similar script. You don't have to have the gospel or a New Testament readings. But they'll have Old Testament readings, they'll have a very solemn reading from the Torah, the first five books of Moses, right? There'd be a procession with it. The Torah is kept in a, like a tabernacle. It's got a flame burning there the whole time, uh, the eternal flame of God. Very, you know, very, very, very similar. And then when you get to the liturgy of the Eucharist, it's our Passover, you know, so if you look at what... You know, the prayers of the Passover are things like, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. You know, what do we pray at the Eucharist? Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. And then do what Jesus said to do at the Last Supper. We count those acts at the Last Supper and so forth. So, very, very similar. So, when, when people say to you, Catholics invented this stuff, which you're apt to hear, you know, we didn't. You know, we're, we're, we're doing what Jesus did. When Jesus prayed, he would have prayed like we're praying. You know, he went to the synagogue. Uh, any questions before we start with nothing? And again, love to tell Anthony and Naomi to watch the video that Bob was recording. Do we want to start with an opening song? You're the choir, Carol. Pick an opening song. Well, when, I, when we. Okay. 
We could start with uh, the solitaris, if you like. So the thing, the, the blessed sacrament, when I take it out of the tabernacle, that what it's in is called the luna. And I'll kind of hold it up so you can see it. It kind of looks like a crescent moon. And the host sits in it. So people really, it sounds fancy now, but people really weren't very original with naming things. You know, they kind of named things the way they looked. All right, anything? Let's start.
any of the most precious blood that we can get that out? Just the last page of last week's handout.
The divine praises. Blessed be God. Blessed be, God. Blessed be His holy name. Blessed, Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed, Blessed, Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be His most sacred heart. Blessed be His most. 
most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit of the Paraclete. Blessed be your great mother of God, Mary's most holy. Blessed be your holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be your glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of your Mary, Virgin Mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God, you his angels. So when I was in Lakehead's 
poster. It's historic St. Mary's, 1751. And then St. Joseph's is down the street from that They're only 50 years old. So between the two, you can hit morning mats, noon mats. It's um, and I don't know if there's other new people. I, I might be overstepping my swim lane here. I brought some resources. So well, good. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. There, there's all sorts of books you can get for Eucharistic adoration. This one, I highly recommend it for anyone who, this is um, the Ascension. They walk you through, it's Father Josh, and how to do it with scripture, rosary, catechism, lights of saints, just to give you some options. I have a holy woman, or holy hours for women. This is great. This was put together by some nuns. There's a hundred of these in here. Um, and I usually can't get through the first paragraph because my because all of a sudden I latch on to something. And That's a good way to pray. It is. That's a good yeah. sign. Yeah, and I thank you. And then Hallow app, which I use, they've got lots of adoration hours in there. And they'll do different ones like imaginative prayer, mm -hmm. where you're inviting Jesus into that, just med meditative prayer, and have music. So there's so many options. For me personally, it took me about a year to kind of like add a year to <laughs> Anyway, but now I can't live without it. <laughs> anyway, I have to, if anyone wants to look at these, you're welcome. Do you have a favorite? Absolutely. Is there one that you lean to or tomorrow? I'll be really honest with you. I, if I rotate, so you can do online adorations legit. Now, Deacon Mary, I can check that with you, but the Boston Bishop said so that was that's like legit. So I watch live adoration. There's one specifically of Holy that I love, and you can catch them on the bottom of um, EWTN. And it's the Holy Mother in this beautiful class of the Eucharist. It's gorgeous, and as the light changes during the day, Dusty's been watching it. Um, anyway, but I do that, and I find that my what I don't aim to do on address, like, here's my intent. I just surrender it up. I do a ton of journaling, and when I go back and look at those reflections, it's got to be the Holy Spirit, because that's not anything Jack would come up with, for sure. <laughs> so I do a lot of journaling, and I encourage that during adoration. Um, and then I go back in and look at it, and I call it my knowing, like my knowing place, like here's these, you know, these you know, wisdom nuggets out there. Anyway. So I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I just let the Holy Spirit yeah. take me through it. Yeah. The EWTN is a good way to see, you know, if you want to see this done again on in, in, it's not something going on. That we would not, this week being Holy Week, we will not have adoration during the week. Uh, things kind of go into a, into a, I don't know, what's, what's the right word there? What do things go into during Holy Week? You get a very, very solemn, somber tone to them. Wednesday is the Chrism Mass with the Bishop. If anybody has a chance to go, that's usually a beautiful thing to do. I, I won't make it. I told Father Sidrash tonight, I'm getting so far behind on things at home that I, I won't go. But you know, St. Augustine, two hours here, two hours back, and then an hour or more for the Chrism Mass. So It is a beautiful Mass. It is a beautiful the parking and having to get there early enough to have room in the church. It's a weekday, you know. It's a big so, work. And, you know, I mean, well, for the clergy, it's not a problem getting in, but it's uh, parking is a problem, because if you go there on a Sunday, you can park in that bank parking lot, and pay for it, of course. But uh, on a weekday, you got to park in St. They open up St. The, the Cathedral School, which is several blocks away, but you can park at the Cathedral School and walk. But, yeah. It is nice to see at least one priest from every parish, yeah. so they get their blessed oils. And Father Sebastian will be there. He's since I'm not going, he's going to hit your eye with some of the priests from Holy Faith. So. All right. Any other questions about adoration or exposition or any of that? That, that this this was a streamlined version, of course. Normally, you want to come, you can spend some time and enter in. But it's already 10:15, and I want to <clears throat> briefly go over the events of the Triduum. Triduum, you know, means three days. And again, I wish Naomi and Anthony were here because this is a critical day for them. Uh, but, okay. We're going to have, before I forget, we will have a rehearsal. Sat the, the, man, the, the Easter Vigil Mass is Saturday at 8.30 p.m. It has to be dark when, when it begins. It must be dark. Uh, 
and we'll have a rehearsal. Six o'clock is good for those who will have a part in things. So, Christy, Dave, Sue, of course, Naomi, and Anthony, and, uh, uh, because there's some back and forth and some orchestration that has to be done. Bob, I assume you're going to make the comments again, the announcements again beforehand about everybody to go to the back. If they want. Yeah, I, I would like, I'm going to write down, but if I forget, which is very likely, please ask people not to use their cell phone flashlights during the lucinarium, where the church is supposed to be dark. Uh, you know, yeah, I know we all have them, but you know, that is so... You know, to see this bright light in the big kids. It's new but age. It's new age, yes, exactly, exactly. They can watch my video. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So people want to be able to read along. I understand that, but, but that this is just this one day. The church asks the church, for the church to be dark, except for the Easter candle. I, I have known priests who have gotten into trouble because they'll go unscrew the bowl from the exit lamps. It's dark means dark. And you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. But they do it anyway. Um, but, and, and I've had arguments with the choir, because the choir says, well, we need light. Well, you've got your book lights. Yes, that's the one exception. They have their lights over their music stands because they need to see what they're doing. But please don't turn on the overhead lights. Over the choir body just destroys the whole, I don't want to say the mood, but the ambiance, but, but the church is trying to set, it's a dark church, you know, it, it, uh, the world in darkness before Christ emerges from the grave, and it's trying to—it's it's a very orthodox way of doing things. It's trying to involve all of your senses, you know, to bring you into this liturgy, not—not uh, not just uh, through one or two, of it, but every possible way, through through listening, and you can smell even the beeswax paschal candle, and, and it's, it's dark except for that candle. And so, forth. so I gave a little summary here, which you all probably know. Uh, but for the benefit of Naomi and Anthony, I hope they can watch it on the video. Uh, Holy Week starts today. Thank you, Melody. Oh, that goes on the hanger back there, too. I leave that one here. You can, you can put that out there as well. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, today begins Holy Week with this Passion Sunday, or everybody calls it Palm Sunday because you get, you get palms. Um, you remember the crowd shout Hosanna? What does Hosanna mean? Save us now. Save us Save now. Us. What language is it? Uh, Aramaic. Aramaic, yes. Hosa is saved when you put that suffix of na, it's, it's now, you know, kind of a polite tone to it. Hosanna, save us now. That's what they're shouting to Jesus. Uh, I don't know if I should make Bob turn off the camera. Uh, now, Father Sebastian, he makes a little goof in the homily, one that many, 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 many people make because it preaches so well. He said, look at that. These people are shouting, Hosanna, son of David, yay, save us, hooray, Jesus, and so forth. And then they're all of a sudden shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Now, how easy these people went from shouting, hooray, Jesus, to crucify him. You know what the problem with that is, right? And it's a completely different group of people. <laughs> the, the people that are shouting Hosanna are the people from Galilee who came down with him as he's coming into Jerusalem. You know, it's the Passover. That's a pilgrim feast. At least all men are required to go up to Jerusalem. And again, remember, you always go up to Jerusalem. As uh, the Jewish scripture scholar, A.J. Levine, she says, you could be on the moon. You still go up to Jerusalem. Jews, Jerusalem is the mountain. It's not much of a mountain, but you still go up to, your, up to Jerusalem. And it's like, you know, considering where we live, it's kind of like when there's a big game with the Gators on campus. If you come a day, a couple days before, what are your chances of finding a hotel room? No good, right? You're not going to get one because the, the, the place fills with, with people. That was Jerusalem during the Passover, right? The place, you come in, you can join us. The place, it's a little, it was a little city. It wasn't a big city. It's, 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 it's not even a city. It's, it's the people say Jerusalem isn't a city with a temple in it. Jerusalem is a temple with a city around it, okay? 
Uh, but then for Passover, the crowd swelled to well over a million people in what's the little tiny old town. There's no room in hotels. There's no, you know. Uh, that's why Jesus probably went to the Mount of Olives. Just like people today. What do they do? They bring tents and they tailgate. They camp out. Um, they, they, they have their campers. You know, there are all these campers parked on campus during the game day. Same idea. Same idea. As a matter of fact, people are fascinated that on the Mount of Olives, there's a cave. And although we don't know this because it's not in Scripture, but people, it's not unreasonable to assume that to stay warm at night, Jesus and his disciples went into that cave, lit a fire and so forth. Um, we don't know. That's just conjecture. Come on in, Mary. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, those were the people shouting Hosanna. Now, when did the people shout crucify him? It was early Friday morning. These were the Judeans, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Right? The, uh, the Hazana shouting people are still out in the hills, camping, sleeping. Right? They're, 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 they're not there right now. Er, Jesus was crucified at 9 o'clock. All that stuff with the, with the Sanhedrin and so forth, that all happened. Pontius Pilate, that all happened much, much earlier. So it was early Friday morning. There would not have been any of the Galileans there. Right? It would just been the Judeans, not the Jews. They'll never say the Jews, because that's why we get accused of being anti-Semitic, right? Everybody was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. The apostles were Jews. Everybody was a Jew, right? I mean, it's not the Jews. It's Ju the Judeans, the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem. They were the ones who shouted, crucify him. And these are two completely separate groups of people. Although, you see, it preaches so well to tell people, well, yeah. One day we're shouting Hosanna, and the next day we're shouting crucify him. So I can ju you just you just have to let go. But you could tell. How did the how did the maid maid woman that you hear about know that Peter was a Galilean? He's just standing there warming himself with with the with the fire, right? How did they know? He looked like everybody else. How do you know somebody is from up north? Or how do you know somebody is from down south? The accent, exactly. The Galileans had an accent, so that's why I mean, Peter said something, and I, you're one of them, aren't you? I can tell by your accent that you're not from these parts. You're from somewhere up north. You're Yankees, you know? You're not one of us Southerners. That's, that's you know, so you got to read this in that way. So anyway, that's what we're going to hear today during the Passion. We're in cycle B, so we're going to hear from Mark. Uh, and, and I mentioned the prism mass. The prism mass, if you can go, beautiful, beautiful liturgy. Technically, all the clergy, certainly all the priests, but certainly all the clergy of the diocese are expected to be there, but that doesn't always work. For most, certainly for most deacons, it's a working day. And if you're working, you're working, you know, and it's a two hour drive from here to there, and a two hour. So if you don't see, like, I, I, I don't often go for that very, very reason. But the big thing that happens at that Mass is that the bishop blesses the oils that are used for the sacraments throughout the year. So it's the oil of the catechumens. I hope I gotta make sure, Bob, remind me, we gotta make sure we contact Naomi. I told Francis that she would carry off the oil of the catechumens because she was recently a catechumen and she's gonna get baptized at the vigil. So she'll carry the oil up. Uh, and then there's the oil of the sick, the OI, oil of the infirm, and then there's the sacred chrism. Uh, and so the bishop does those three, blesses those three oils at the mass, and then all the parishes pick up their supply of oil for the year and bring it back. And the priests at that mass renew their commitment to the priesthood. So that's what, what happens there. Um, the prison mass. And then the... Uh, Nothing much happens after Wednesday until, well, Thursday. Uh, Thursday is the Mass of the Lord's Supper at, what is it again, Christy? 7 p.m.? I, I, said, I said by mistake, 7.30. Christy, fortunately, was there to correct me. 7 p.m. is the Mass of the Lord's Supper. Um, you'll, you'll find it a bit unique in a way in that the Blessed Sacrament will not be in the church when you enter. No need to genuflect. The tabernacle door should be wide open. Uh, everybody is supposed to receive from a host consecrated at that mass. And, uh, th this, this is the mass that commemorates the institution of what shall we say, really holy orders, but but you know it, it, the, the 
the priesthood or the episcopacy, right? It's Jesus and the apostles, the 11 remaining apostles are, in a sense, consecrated or ordained as bishops, yeah? and bishops possess the fullness of the priesthood. A priest doesn't possess the fullness of the priesthood, only a bishop possesses the fullness of the priesthood, which is why the, a priest can't ordain other priests or deacons, only a bishop can do that. Yeah? And it, when a bishop is ordained a bishop, he, it's really hot because underneath the chasuble, he wears the deacon vestment of the Dalmatic. So he's really, Richard, he's got a lot of layers on during that time. So the church temperature, I hope they put way down for him, uh, keep it nice and cool. Uh, so the. Are there no other masses on Holy Thursday? No other masses. You cannot mass celebrate Mass on Holy Thursday except for the Mass of the Lord's Supper. That, that evening. Um, and um, uh, um, what else was going to say something else? But uh, th that's the first Mass on Holy Thursday. Okay. That the sacred triduum, triduum means three days. Always remember it's one single liturgy in three parts that's spread out over three days. And at, at, at the Holy Thursday Mass, we remember the institution of the Eucharist, that's what, the institution of the priesthood, but really the institution of the episcopacy, the bishops, because it was later on in the Acts of the Apostles that the Apostles decided, hey, we need some help here. So they, they instituted the, the um, presbyterate, which are the, is the priesthood, and the diaconate, which, which are the deacons. So they come out of the Acts of, of the Apostles. The way I like to understand it, the way I explain it, is that at the Last Supper, Jesus instituted the Sacrament of Holy Orders. Uh, and that is the office, the office of bishop, priest, and deacon. Later on, in the Acts of the Apostles, the, ap the Apostles established the office, the order, not the office, the order of priests and deacons. So, all, holy orders is one sacrament, right, with three degrees to it. And Jesus kind of, what shall we say, what's the good word, commissions the, the, the remaining apostles, with well, Judas too, you know, but he took off, right? Uh, he's the betrayer. Uh, but, but that's, he, he kind of establishes bishops, and then the bishops later establish priests and deacons. When they decide they need help because the church is growing. And um, we, so we commemorate the institution of the priesthood, the institution of the Eucharist, and we commemorate that out with the washing of the feet. So we have to remind, remember, Bob, we have to remind Anthony and, uh, and Naomi that they volunteered and they're going to get their foot washed at the Holy Thursday Mass. Because that, that really underscores. Um, it's you know, Holy Thursday by the Protestants is called Maundy Thursday. You've heard of Maundy Thursday, and it's from that Gospel of John, uh, a new commandment I give you: Mandatum novum dovobis. Mandatum mandate. You know how languages work. Somehow mandatum became Maundy. Um, whatever. Uh, a new commandment I give you: Love one another as I have loved you. This is how people will know that you are my disciples if you wash one, if you love one another. And then Jesus takes off his outer garment, puts on an apron, gets down and washes the feet of the apostles. And then he says, you, you call me Lord and Master, so I am. But if I've done this for you, what, what should you do for others? You know, so it's, it's a, a holy orders is a, a sacrament of service, okay? A sacrament, of both sacraments of order, marriage and holy orders, are sacraments of service, right? In a marriage, a husband serves his wife and the wife serves, serves his husband. Uh, that's the purpose of marriage, is one leads the other to heaven. That's what it's all about, right? Uh, and in holy orders, the, the, the uh, hierarchy of bishop, priest, and deacon serve others by helping lead them to heaven through, through the sacraments and so forth. So that's, that's what Holy Thursday is all about. It's after the washing of the feet, it's kind of the mass as usual, uh, except at the end it gets very, really beautiful, okay? Um, there's no final blessing. The, there will be a procession with the, the church will be left empty, no blessed sacrament left in the church. There'll be a procession from the church to here. The blessed sacrament will be reserved in this tabernacle. This 
this little area here is going to be decked out like you've never seen it before, more beautiful, with flowers and candles and, and all, all these nice things. The um, Blessed Sacrament will be reserved here. In this place, how late will it stay open, Melody, to maybe 9, 10, 11, or 12 o'clock? A lot of people like to remain and pray in, in, in here. Okay. And it's beautiful. We, we sing Pange Lingue, you know, the, the, the same melody as Tantra Mergo. It's the last verse of Tantra Mergo. Um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful closing to the Holy Thursday liturgy. A very soft, somber closing. And then, uh, you know, we, we, we go home and we return again on Good Friday at 3 o'clock. Um, I, it, there's no, nowhere in the world is there a mass celebrated on Good Friday. You have to consecrate enough hosts on Holy Thursday that will be reserved here for everybody to receive communion on Good Friday. There is communion on Good Friday. I love the Orthodox call Good Friday the Mass of the pre -sanctified. And that's a wonderful, a wonderful title for it. You know, because it's not a, it, it, it's not a, you see, it's one liturgy that begins on Holy Thursday and ends with the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday. So you're in, you're in the context, you're in the framework of the, um, the, of this one single liturgy. And there are hosts consecrated on Holy Thursday for you to receive communion on Holy Friday. One of the beautiful things we do on Holy Friday is we have a veneration of the cross, um, the reproaches of Good Friday. Remember, I, I, in that one homily, people have asked me for copies of that. I know it's the reproaches of Good Friday. We used to do them. Scott has agreed to do them. I think it's one of the most beautiful Good Friday prayers. The one where I raised you on the high, to the heights of the highest heights, and you raised me high on the cross. That one, I led you from the slavery to freedom. You led me to the cross. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful prayers. Tears come, you know, if they don't bring tears to your eyes, nothing will. And we all come up, we venerate the cross with a kiss or, or, or some sort of act of reverence to it. Um, the cross kind of makes a solemn entrance, you know, behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. Uh, 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 behold the wood of the cross on which hung our salvation. Come, let us adore. Is what the, 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 the sum as the cross enters the church. Uh, so the Holy Friday is... Um, Beautiful day, uh, where where a somber day, you know, very, a you know a sad day and a joyous day, you know, because we know the we know the answer, we know the final story. It would be a horrible som horrible somber day if if it weren't for the resurrection. But keep in mind, we call it Good Friday. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be bad Friday. <laughs> Everything we thought didn't work, you know. So it's Good Friday. Oh, happy fall. Uh, oh, happy fall. That's what you hear on the Easter Vigil. Uh, there are, there are. If, if you look at the hierarchy of hymns that we sing in the church, there, the top three are started with the way they do the awards. Starting with number three is the Gloria. That's, you know, what we sing on Sundays. Glory to God in my that one. Uh, number two on the list, you're familiar with if you do the, the, the divine office, the prayers in the church, and that's the Te Deum Gaudatum. Te Deum Gaudatum. Uh, da da we praise you, Lord, that's done on Sundays and solemnities from the, uh, the invitatory, that, that part of the. Uh, uh, and then number one, topping the charge of all times, is the exultant which you hear at the Easter Vigil. Um, beautiful. Listen carefully to the words. I probably have it. I could find it probably on my phone. Um, can you find it real quick, Christy? If you have time, it's worth listening to. And that's what Carol said. Oh, happy fall. You know, the, the sin of Adam is referring to. Oh, happy fall, which has gained for us such a Savior. And it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's the Passover of Passovers, in a sense. And the words... Uh, of, of the hymn are, this is the night, you know, not that was the night, this is the night that, that you know, Christ broke the chains of death, this is the night that, that you know, the, the world saw Christ emerge triumphant from the grave, uh, and it begins, rejoice, oh, rejoice church, rejoice, oh, mother earth, rejoice heavens, rejoice everybody, because this is the night of nights. 
Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Did you find it? I know the lyrics. I also have the song. I don't have to play it on here. Try it.
Thank you, Christy. It's so beautiful. As you hear, oh, happy fall, Felix Culpa, for a Latin phrase that probably a lot of people know. It sounded nice in here, too. Oh, Felix Culpa. You, this was the full version. You won't hear the full version. Of it. To have the full version, I'm supposed to sing it, and I would not want to torture you. Like that. <laughs> no. So Scott will do it, but Scott can't do the full version. He has to do it. And we begin outside, uh, lighting of an Easter fire, uh, the Easter candle is blessed. Um, it's, it's, it's an absolute, it's the most beautiful, it's the most beautiful liturgy of the entire year, without a doubt, bar none. Um, we hear the whole story of salvation history, starting with the story of creation in the book of Genesis, all the way through to the Easter story. There are nine Old Testament readings. Uh, and then the epistle, and then the gospel, uh, and until until the gospel, uh, until the old throughout the Old Testament, we're in a darkened church, right? and it's just again beautiful, beautiful beyond belief. The ransom of slave, you gave away your son. I'm absolutely beautiful. You want something to, to reflect on during a time of adoration? Print out the words of the exalted, and just slowly read them before the blessed sacrament. You, 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 you'll be taken up to heaven. I hear you will. It's so, so beautiful. We do that to read. Well, and not in here it wouldn't be. If you bring a copy with uh, you. Uh, yeah. And if you're alone in here and you can start, you can use your cell phone flashlight. <laughs> Just don't do it during the, uh, again, the loose scenario and the service of light. And then, you know, after, after the gospel, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like, a mass as usual. We have to rehearse because, you know, there's a time when Naomi will go and get baptized. So there's, and you know where our baptismal font is. It's in the back of the church. And we're going to be in the front of the church. So get up and process and so forth. And then there's going to be the, uh, for, for, for Dave and Jesse, there, there's going to be the, make a, a profession of faith. Um, I'll have it printed out for you. But you basically say, I believe and profess that all the Catholic Church teaches, believes, and proclaims to be revealed by God. That's it. Father Sebastian then says something like, the Church receives you with great joy, uh, and then you can be confirmed. Now, it's, it's, it's beautiful beyond belief, the whole, the whole thing. But again, th th there's some practice there required because for the confirmation, you know. And Father Sebastian will be there because he'll have his own idea of where he wants you to stand, he want, does he want you here, does he want you there, all that sort of thing. And he'll change his mind, you know, that sort of thing. So, <laughs> always, 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 you know. We'll rehearse it and then he'll go, I've changed my mind. <laughs> but that's okay, we'll get, we'll get through it just fine. But we want to we wanna practice just the uh, basics uh, of the motions through it. And then we'll have a little reception after the Mass is over. Not, you know, people are going to be tired of wanting to go home. We do not meet next Sunday, right? Because we'll probably all be tired from, from the Easter vigil. I'll bet you Christy will be here for the 7.30 Mass. Uh -huh. so, I, I, just, I won't be here 7.30. You know, I'll, I'll be here. Uh -huh. Just see. And so that's, that's, that's it. That's what's happening very, very, very soon. Bob, well, could you send us um, a copy of the reproaches that we can find? Of the what? The reproaches, the Good Friday reproaches. I, I have them. I, I, you know, for that homily, I, 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 I had to abbreviate them, though. I didn't want to, you know, reproaches to go on for 10 minutes or something. So I just kind of... So we'll have a copy at church? Or? Scott's going to sing them, and I don't know what he's going to sing. But after he heard me do it, he said, would you like me to do the reproaches on Good Friday? I said, yes, 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 please. Yeah, please I thought maybe please. just for our own meditations. Yes, I, I, I could, I'll get a copy to Bob, and Bob can post them. Yes. Of the, the reproaches of Good Friday. And the Exultate, too, the words of the Exultate, so you can have them. I have the homily, too, of the Lord's <laughs> Descent, the old homily. Ancient homily on the yeah, Holy Saturday. Yeah, Oh, please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's nice for all of us for this week to start to, you know, meditate on these things and enter in more deep, you know, deeply. In. That's right. Um, the following Sunday, the second Sunday of Easter. Easter, it's it's an octave feast. 
that means Easter Sunday lasts eight days. You know, that number eight is symbolic in the sense that it's seven days of creation plus one. You know, so it continues. It's, 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 it's kind of a symbol of eternity, if you like, the number eight, because seven is the completeness and the covenant and all that, and then the eighth day, uh, you hear that a lot. There's a Christian bookstore, or a Catholic bookstore, actually, called Eighth Day Books. Uh, and anyway, the, the Easter, the second Sunday of Easter is the eighth day. It's the ox Sunday within the octave of Easter. And that, so that was declared in 2002, was it? By Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, as Divine Mercy Sunday. And so that Mass is, is on Sunday will be kind of like Mass as usual, but then at, uh, don't, yeah, well, 3 o'clock is, is kind of, I think we start at 2.30 so that we could finish the first part and start the, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, which the choir will sing right at 3 o'clock, give or take a couple of minutes, depending on how it goes. And there will be adoration, be in the church of the Blessed Sacrament. Father Sebastian will be in the confessional the whole time here at Confessions. Uh, and so that, yeah, that too is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, celebration of Divine Mercy. So that's the, the second Sunday of Easter, the, the Sunday after Easter Sunday. Do you want me to read what was said about it? Sure. In St. Faustina's diary, uh, 699, it talk, Jesus talks about the horns of the feast. I said this. On one occasion, I heard these words. My daughter, tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the feast of mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls and especially for the poor sinners. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those souls who approach the fount of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which graces flow are opened. Let no soul fear to draw near to me, even though its sin be as scarlet. My mercy is so great that no mind, be it of man or of angel, will be able to fathom it throughout all eternity. Everything that exists has come forth from the very depths of my most tender mercy. Every soul and its relation to me will contemplate my love and mercy throughout eternity. The feast of mercy emerged from my very depths of tenderness. It is my desire that it be solemnly celebrated on the first Sunday after Easter. Mankind will not have peace until it turns to the fount of my mercy. And you know, one of the precepts of the church is go to communion and confession once a year. Real, real demanding, isn't it? You know? <laughs> Well, that, that if you want to be a true minimalist Catholic, but still be within, just just come sliding in, you know, at the last minute, confession and communion once a year during the Easter season. So that's why Father Sebastian will be in the confessional, um, you know, in case it, 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 well, you, you, you get what I'm saying. I mean, we ought to be going to confession a lot more frequently than that, but the church requires that we do it once a year and receive Holy Communion once a year. It's the uh, age-old thing, you know, when I was young, when I was a child, the confession lines were long, long, long on Saturday. There were four priests and confessionals hearing confessions, and the lines were long. And then Sunday, very, very few people went to Communion. Now it's flip-flop, right? Now it's, it's uh, nobody goes to confession, and everybody goes to Communion. You know? Explain that to me. I don't know. Star. Well, there's two explanations. The closer we are to God, the more aware we are of our sins. So, mm -hmm. those people down there were probably closer to God, so they were more aware of their sins. The other explanation is they just sinned more than we do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a... Could go either way. You know, it's 11 o'clock. I guess, guess we should stop. But, you know, we, we have arrived at the point, and I talk to Catholics, you know, not 
people, good people who just don't know, it, it's just automatically assumed that you die and then you go straight to heaven, you know? And, and people, you know, I have to say, you can't, it's usually at the time of death, you can't really, people are in a bad place usually, so you really can't say too much, but you want to say, well, what do you base that on, you know? I mean, uh, why, 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 why do you think that? You know, that's not what Jesus said. You know, Jesus, if anything, said quite the opposite. I'm, I'm scared to death. He you knows that I'm going to hear those words, depart from me, I don't know who you are. You know, but, 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 I was the guy up at the altar there, there, there. Depart from me, you evil, evil doer. You know, those, are, those aren't sobering words. I don't know, you know. That, that the road to, to heaven is narrow and few are on it, and the road to damnation is wide and many are. You know, I mean, but why have we gotten to the point that you die and you go to heaven? You know, everybody's celebrating. You're in a better place now. All our pain and suffering is over. You know, we are so in desperate need of catechesis, and I think that's the job of each and every one of us here, all of you, to, to you know, just gently, of course, ask people. We've bought into that Protestant, once saved, always saved. You know, I kind of sort of accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm a Catholic, so I must have done that at some point, right? So that's it. I go to heaven when I die. I don't have to worry. And if you don't, if you believe that, if you truly believe that, that you die and you go to heaven, that's the way it is, why do you have, why, why bother going to church? We could sleep in on a Sunday morning, right? I mean, why, why bother going to confession? You know, God loves me. He's going to forgive me. It's like cheap plastic Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras beads God throws at you. That's how people understand mercy, you know. And it's a worthless thing. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I love, you know, called, called cheap grace. You know, God, is, God doesn't give us anything cheap. He gives us the best of the best. So. Can I ask a quick question? On the St. Faustina diary that Christy read, it's great. I have that too. Um, I, the, just a point of clarification on Divine Mercy Sunday specifically, you get almost like a fun, it removes the temporal wounds on your right? Okay, thank to you. get to get a, a plenary indulgence, which includes all punishment from you know, temporal punishment due to sin, uh, you 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 have to be you know, the, the usual conditions for confession, and, but but. You know, and, and you receive Holy Communion. But remember, you know, you weren't here when Christy talked about confession. To go to confession, you have to acknowledge that you are a sinner, um, make a firm commitment not to sin again, um, go confess your sins to a priest, and then do the penance that the priest gives you. So, you know, and to get the plenary indulgence, you need detachment from sin. That's the hardest part, right? I mean, you can go to confession, you can go to communion, but to be detached from sin, even you know, venial sin. even venial sin, sin, you know, really, we have these distinctions between venial and mortal sin, more for like practical reasons, like when you can or can't go to communion. But for for God, even the tiniest, 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 tiniest little speck of sin is important. You know, it's, it's, it's just there's no place in the life of God. So you need to detach yourself from all sin, all sin, and ask for God's grace to do that. So, that, but that's that's the plenary indulgence. I think that handbook, and it's got good discussion in there. Um, I'm just going to throw this out for so you know, the road to heaven is narrow, right? The narrow gate. There's a 15 minute YouTube clip of a priest talking about the, the principle of the fewness to get to heaven, something like that. It is convicting. I mean, it, this is like very few make it to purgatory, much less heaven. That's right. I mean, it's Our Lady of Fatima showed the, the visionaries that, you know, how many people are just kind of falling into hell through usually sexual sins. Can you send that clip to Bob and yeah. Bob can post it for everybody? Are you on Bob's list? I'm not. I don't think we put you on yet. I can be on the Bob's list. Thank you. I would like to be on list. Yeah, it's a real thing to yeah, I mean, we have lost it. I think in many ways we're our own worst enemy. You know, we, everything is great. You know, just, yeah, it's time. My, my time keeper, keeper is pointing to her watch. Uh, all right. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I hope to see all of you on Holy Thursday. Why don't we do that? I think we maybe did that, the, the, the insert.